All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to those in person and uh, everybody online, uh, really for the third in the strategic land power dialogue. And I know the uh, I'm General Bob Brown, the president and CEO of the Association of the United States Army. I'm really proud to be here, and uh, we're very proud to be partnered with CSIS on this and uh, just a tremendous partnership in a key area uh, where we're uh, really uh, making a lot of progress and and knowledge and land power and how critical it is for our nation and security. I also want to thank uh, General Dynamics. It wouldn't be possible without General Dynamics sponsoring this. So really appreciate General Dynamics making this uh, making this series possible. We had uh, two events to kick it off. We had the Secretary of the Army, Secretary Warmoth, and the Chief of Staff of the Army, uh, and uh, General George, and uh, and they really talked land power overall, and it was incredibly successful. Then we went on to uh, the U.S. Army Pacific Commander, uh, General Charlie Flynn. He talked about the role of land power in the Indo-Pacific. So uh, really, uh, both events showed the enormous value of this forum on, on strategic land power. Today, we couldn't be any luckier than to get another great leader, uh, General Jim Dickinson, the uh, commander of U.S. Space Command, for a discussion on the role of the space domain uh, for land power uh, in the Joint Force. So some of you may think it's a little odd uh, that we're here at a strategic land power forum and we're talking about and discussing the space domain and um, what role does space play for land power. And uh, in reality, the U.S. Army is the biggest, the largest user, not just the biggest, but the largest user of space-based capabilities in the Department of Defense, uh, the largest user of the U.S. Army. So, and really, but when you look, for the past two decades, you know, most of us never had to think much about space. You know, when you uh, needed navigation, it was there. Uh, when you uh, needed communications, it was there, it was secure, it worked great, satellite intelligence, targeting coordinates, uh, was always there, always worked, and uh, not, not uh, really contested, if you will. Uh, but today, today and in the future, as we all know, uh, we must think multi-domain and space is the most critical example of why we need to think about all domains. Uh, U.S. competitors, uh, especially when you look at China and Russia, have spent decades studying the information-centric U.S. way of war that largely depends on our advantages in the space domain. And they seek to deny this advantage through multi-domain threats, whether using kinetic weapons, as uh, Russia demonstrated just two years ago, or through cyber and other less kinetic means. Uh, the stark reality is that in a conflict with a peer competitor today, uh, U.S. land forces and the entire joint force would likely face disrupted communications, disrupted navigation, intelligence, and targeting, all the things I went through a few minutes ago that we took for granted. It's not hard to imagine uh, the massive secondary challenges that uh, degradation in all these areas would cause uh, you know, reduced ability to communicate with friendly forces, uh, sustain soldiers in the field or uh, any force in the field, to locate and destroy enemy formations and uh, other uh, capabilities as well would all be degraded, all uh, have a huge effect. So the importance of the connection between land forces and space forces is just critical and land forces must understand the risks they face from the space domain and just as importantly, how land forces can converge effects uh, in the space domain to present adversaries with multiple dilemmas. And that's why today uh, we're so fortunate to have General Dickinson with us to help us understand this essential uh, connection. And I'll only briefly summarize his uh, extensive bio. It's impressive, but you can find it on the uh, CSIS or the AUSA uh, online. It's there. Uh, General Dickinson assumed command of the U.S. Space Command, uh, the, the newest unified combatant command, on 20 August 2020, after serving as the first deputy commander of U.S. Space Command. He's a native of Colorado, a 1985 graduate of Colorado State University, where he earned a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering. He also holds a Master of Sciences in Operations Research and Systems Analysis from Colorado School of Mines, and a Master's in Strategic Studies from the United States Army War College. Throughout his time in the Army, he's commanded at every single level, from platoon all the way up through combatant command, where he is now, and is the senior air and missile defense officer in the Department of Defense. No pressure there, right? <laughs> and, uh, well, I know uh, 
I'll tell you again, very fortunate, haven't had the, the privilege to serve with Jim, uh, very fortunate to have him here. And I know you're, you can't wait to hear from him on these critical topics. So let me pass it over uh, to our moderator, Dr. Tom Carrico. Tom, over to you. Thank you, General Brown. Uh, and thank you, General Dickinson, for being here. Uh, of course, in addition to, to being a senior fellow in the International Security Program here, I also direct the Missile Defense Project. So the fact that you're the uh, department's senior air defender is a very big deal. And uh, you've held a lot of positions there from the uh, commander of 94th and 32nd WMDC, the director of test for MDA, uh, the CG for Army Space and Missile Defense Command. I'm sure we'll, we'll come back to that in just a few minutes. Uh, so we've got a lot to, that we're planning to discuss. We also have a, uh, a, a place on the event page for folks online to submit questions. Please do that. We've already got a bunch come through, uh, and through the magic of uh, uh, tactical satcom, they'll come right here to. <laughs> it wasn't uh, tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Not today, but we have backups. Uh, so thank you, General, to kick this uh, for being here. And to kick things off, I'll just uh, just ask the, the same question I asked uh, Secretary Warmoth and General Flynn, and and that is uh, recognizing your position with the, the Joint Force. Uh, but what is your view of the role of land power within the joint force both today uh, and in the force of 2040? Well, first of all, uh, thanks, General Brown, for that uh, very kind introduction. And I'd be remiss if I didn't take an opportunity publicly to thank you for your service and uh, all the things that you have done in the Army to support not only missile defense but space. And so thanks for what you do. Uh, Tom, thanks for having me today. Uh, I would tell you that's a great question. So. Uh, I'll answer it from the perspective is I always think that the land component will be a very pivotal, critical element to any future fight, whether it's today or to 2040. But I would also tell you that space will make those formations, that army, uh, successful in all that it does. When you look at the amount of dependency uh, on critical space assets, critical space enablers, and I'm talking about satellite communications, GPS, missile warning, and electronic warfare, those core space enabling effects will facilitate any future fight and a current fight today. And we're seeing that uh, today in and around the world with all the different uh, conflicts that are going on in Ukraine and Russia as well as Israel. Space is decisive and it's critical to what we do each and every day. Let's just uh, start as we always do with the threat. Uh, it's you know, space, and you frequently uh, as well uh, describe it as uh, contested, competitive, and uh, congested. Talk to us about what that means to you. What do you, what do you think about there uh, most? Well, I certainly, we spend a lot of time in U.S. Space Command, as you would think, uh, understanding our competition. So in my strategic vision, I talk, one of my key tasks for the command is, uh, is understanding the competition. And when I talk about that, I'm not talking about just understanding numbers of capabilities uh, that the PRC and the Russians are putting into space or utilizing, having an effect from ground to space. I'm talking about actually understanding their philosophy, their thinking, what their leadership is, and how they're incorporating space into their operations. Both Russia and the PRC established their space commands back in 2015. As you all know, we established our U.S. Space Command in 2019, August, as well as the Space Force in December of that same year. So as we look towards the, uh, the PRC, for example, you know, we've seen them develop capabilities. You know, just within the last couple of years, they've doubled the number of satellites on orbit. They have done technical demonstrations that show that they have a direct descent ASAT capability, uh, ASAT capabilities that can hold our high-value assets or our satellites at risk. We've also seen the fact that they can fly their own version of a space plane a couple of times. And we also know that they're building capabilities from a terrestrial perspective that can have effects on space, everything from lasers to uh, electronic warfare. And they, op they op absolutely understand how important space is to their operations. They've watched us for many years, understanding and watching how we leverage space capabilities to have a power projection capability worldwide. And as we, as we do operations around the world, particularly in the Middle East, we leverage, obviously, space very much. They're watching us. They're understanding what our philosophy is and how we incorporate space. The Russians, on the other hand, you know, we've seen some destructive activity from them as well in terms of the Nudal anti-satellite test that they demonstrated back in 2021, where they created a deep debris field of about 1,500 uh, pieces of debris that uh, we continue to track today. And so we, we saw them demonstrate that. They, too, 
have a, a large inventory of directed energy weapons, uh, terrestrial base that have electronic warfare as well as laser capabilities. Uh, they too have on orbit counter space capabilities that they've demonstrated. And they too understand how fundamental and important space is to what they do in their operations as well. So we're seeing a, you know, a, a PRC threat that's increasing in capability very quickly. Uh, the Russians not so fast. Uh, so they've had some limitations, as we know, given the conflict in Ukraine in terms of, you know, the, you know, financing to be able to do those types of capabilities. They haven't stopped, but they're continuing at a maybe a little bit slower pace. So from an adversary competitor perspective, that is, that is large. The other thing I would mention is, you know, that's the uh, contested part of the domain. The competitive part of it is, you know, the growth in the commercial industry in space. I can talk about that here in a little bit. Uh, but then the, the other piece is the congestion. So uh, U.S. Space Command has a responsibility of tracking and reporting out on debris and objects in space, whether they're active or inactive satellites, debris that has been caused by events like the Nudal, as well as uh, satellites that just start to deteriorate on orbit. And so when this command stood up back in 2019, we tracked about 25,000 objects. Uh, today, it's over 45,000. And that's just a short period of time of four years. Uh, and that's due to many things. But that is the congested part of the domain, particularly in the low Earth orbit. Well, you, 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 you mentioned paying attention to how they're weaving this into their, uh, their operations, their philosophy. Uh, the PRC has claimed to be uh, destroying or capturing satellites and other sensors. Uh, uh, they've talked about uh, sort of this mega constellation that I think you uh, alluded to. Why do you think they're doing that? What is their philosophy on these things that, that makes sense of these uh, activities? Well, of course, they're, they're a spacefaring nation right now, but uh, they do want to have the dominant, in my opinion, dominant role in space. And they understand our dominant role in space right now and the capabilities that we have today and in the future and what we've used in the past. And so they. I think they clearly understand the importance of that and the dominance of that domain. And so I think that's where they're, they're uh, proceeding. And you, you, you mentioned some of the demonstrations on orbit. You know, I would just highlight the, the SJ-21 that we saw not too long ago, which was uh, a dual-use space capability, counter space capability that they have out there where they were actually able to grapple, grab a hold of one of their defunct GPS or beta satellites and actually take that satellite out past the geo orbit, drop it off and return back to the geo orbit and did that in a very short period of time, only a few days, demonstrating what? Demonstrating that they have a technical capability that they can use and they can employ it in, in terms of planning and operations. So uh, uh, while they call that a dual use capability, you know, we could also know what that means to us in terms of of a, a military uh, operation as well. So they're, they're demonstrating how they can do that. So you also alluded to Chinese space plane tests, for instance. If you, if you could speak to kind of the, the, the salience of hypersonic things coming in and out of the atmosphere, uh, and uh, likewise that uh, basically things that orbit and, and deorbit uh, uh, as well. So that's a, that's a capability that, uh, that we're watching, obviously, very closely but demonstrating a capability of being able to put something in orbit uh, at a very high rate of speed that can, can move, you know, circle the Earth in 90 or so minutes in one revolution, and then, you know, potentially has the capability of, uh, of re-entering where they desire it to re-enter, and then presenting a challenge for us in terms of missile warning, missile defense, tracking, custody of that capability. And so we continue to look at that very closely, but that's a capability they just recently demonstrated. You also highlighted as well the Nudal test uh, from 2021. How did that look from your, uh, from your vantage point at Space Command at the time? Well, so I'll just write up front, irresponsible act. Uh, if you recall when that happened in November of 21, uh, we had the National Space Council about two weeks later just here in D.C. And, uh, and we heard the Vice President of the United States talk about how how irresponsible act that is. Yeah, I would tell you, you know, demonstrating that technology or that capability, producing that amount of debris on orbit, uh, you know, really, debris on orbit doesn't know whether it's, it's, it's friendly or foe, right? Debris is debris. So when you do an event like that, that threatens everything from, every, you know, 
any country that would have a satellite on orbit. It's not like that the debris they produced was able to, you know, be there for some other country to, to fly through or have an effect. It's there, it remains there, and in some cases it remains there for many, many years. And uh, uh, because it doesn't necessarily act as you would expect with gravity. It can, it can sustain that orbit for a period of time depending on the altitude at which uh, that event happens. So uh, it's very important to remember that in terms of the amount of debris that it created. By the way, I just mentioned, you know, we had the International Space Station that was a few hundred kilometers beneath it uh, in altitude. But what else was up in that, in the low Earth orbit that's there today that hasn't been there for, or it's up there for the very first time would be the Chinese space station. So again, you know, when you demonstrate something like that, conduct an event like that, it has long-term effects. And, uh, and when we look at the tenets of responsible behavior for space, which the Department of Defense has formalized, Secretary Austin has signed off on it, there are five tenets of that responsible behavior. And the world, the United Nations as a whole, is recognizing the fact that we, we need to have norms of behavior in space because of the dependency, not only of the military, but of our uh, civilian, uh, our civilian populace as well. The amount of information that we rely upon, the amount of technical experts, technical capabilities that come from space is very, very important. And I would just tell you, you know, uh, of course I'm in the military, uh, obviously I'm in the Department of Defense, I think I'm in charge of military type of operations and how we protect and defend on orbit, but we all need to remember that space has a very, very big part of humanitarian support, whether it's weather, whether it's other types of capabilities that we're able to share with the world, and it's not just the United States, it's our allies and partners too. So there's a, you know, there's a, not only a commercial, but there's also, you know, um, uh, capabilities that we provide and information that's so important that starts in space. So uh, here at CSIS, the uh, Aeros Aerospace Security Project, uh, currently led by Kerry Bingen, uh, puts out an annual space threat assessment. Uh, using just open source material. Uh, and this, uh, this 2020, 2023 report uh, talks about the quote unquote cat and mouse games uh, that are apparently going on between US uh, geo SSA satellites uh, and uh, Chinese things. Uh, I, question uh, for you is what are we learning about China's uh, rendezvous and proximity operations and perhaps their TTPs? Well, so uh, obviously I can't talk exactly what we're learning from them. Uh, given the form that we're in today, but I would just tell you that it's obvious that they value uh, maneuver in space just as we do. We've been doing that mission for several years, which is with our GSAP vehicles that are in geo orbit. Uh, they're termed our neighborhood watch capability as they traverse the, the geo orbit. But if you look at what they're doing, they're doing a very similar thing. And they value the, the opportunity to be able to uh, exercise their capabilities that they're developing and putting on orbit. So, you know, if you were to draw an analogy, which I always try to do when we're talking about space, we watch what they do in the air domain, the maritime domain, uh, and to a lesser extent, the land domain in terms of how they are improving their capabilities and being able to do maneuver. So you highlighted a couple things, the grappling and taking it to a graveyard orbit and that kind of thing, and you don't have to be too imaginative to, to think about what that could, could do for disrupting our uh, kill chains. So how, in, in, in the context of that, uh, how critical is service-to-service -service connectivity uh, and interoperability for among the several services? Well, I think, uh, you know, that's that broader question of how are we getting to a, a command and control a capability that not only goes service-to-service -service, but transcends the di different domains. And so how do we build that? You know, that's really something we've been looking at uh, for many years within each respective domain. Uh, and we have had some success in it, but how do you have it so it spans all the domains and, and all the services? So really the department's efforts here has been on the uh, CJAD C2 and how you build a, you know, you know a, a database, if you will, that has that kind of repository of that information for the domains and then how is that accessible to each of the consumers, if you will, or services that would need that particular information. So how do you build that? That is a big challenge and we're looking very closely at it. Not only how do you build it, but how do you protect it? Right. Now, uh, so our adversaries are clearly messaging that they see space as a war fighting domain. Uh, maybe kind of, we could move now to your operational uh, perspectives. Uh, what does that mean to you? Space as an operational domain or as a war fighting domain? 
Well, uh, I would just say that, uh, you know, we approach operations in space every day in U.S. Space Command. In other words, how do we uh, build capability and have a culture of operations slash warfighting in the command? Because uh, as we look to the future in some of the events that I just described, it's going to take a mindset and a culture like we see in the other domains, air, land, and sea. In other words, how do we do the planning? How do we do the execution? How do we do the targeting? Uh, those are all critical elements of what we're doing within the command. And really, over four years, we have built that out in the command. The command right now is a joint combatant command, just like the other 10 combatant commands. We are the newest, uh, and we're the most popular. No, I'm, but, uh, um, <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, when, when I look at that, it's like, so what does that mean to my operations in space? What it means is I've got a joint warfighting force within the command that does what? has had many years of experience in Iraq and Afghanistan. They've come in, they have the experience of what it means to do joint operations, joint planning, joint targeting, and we couple that with our space expertise within the command, and that has accelerated us from where we were in 2019 until where we are today in 2023, which is a, a combatant command that is able to produce strategic effects for the nation and for our leadership. And so I would go back to uh, the Newdall test in 2021, uh, when I was sitting in my Joint Operations Center, I had my staff around me, I had plans and options in front of me, and uh, what was I able to do? For the, you know, one of the first major events that we had as a COCOM, I was able to develop strategic dialogue with my leadership and the other combatant commands of what we saw, how we characterized it, and just as important, we were able to strategically message uh, to the world that that was an irresponsible act. And by the way, that was fully supported and, uh, and uh, emphasized with our allies and partners. And so, so when you talk about strategic effects, it has to do with a joint command, has to have a command that understands the importance, understands the competition, like I mentioned earlier, so we can do our, do our missionaries. Well, you are a popular command. <laughs> uh, and space is a popular uh, topic uh, broadly. But the question then becomes, is there a congestion of space organizations across uh, the military, the, the Pentagon broadly? And I'm thinking here of uh, an article by uh, my friend Todd Harrison, Mackenzie Aiglin, uh, kind of questioning the, uh, the need or the logic of having both a space force and a space command. Your reaction to that? Yeah, so my reaction to that is, uh, um, first of all, as I mentioned, you know, what is the role of a COCOM? What is the role of the service? And so, you know, the COCOMs by the Goldwater Nichols Act of 1986 does what? We do operations in warfighting. The services do organize, train, and equip. So normally I use the Army, since this is uh, AUSA, I'll use the Army analogy that I draw on. And that is, what does Forces Command, what does the big Army do in support of CENTCOM, for example? Uh, General Carrillo will say, I've got a demand signal for an Army division for example. And so what will happen is that demand signal gets back to the Army. The Army does what? All organizes and trains and equips a division, certifies it, and deploys it. Once General Carrillo gets that capability, he does as he sees fit in terms of how that will fit or accomplish the missions that he has been given. It's a very, the analogy is the same, the, the relationship between Space Force and U.S. Space Command. Uh, General Saltzman and the U.S. Space Force organize, train, and equip our exquisite space capabilities, trains the guardians that do that mission, and then when they're trained and certified, he presents them to U.S. Space Command, and I do the operations piece to it, whatever that may be. Uh, PNT, satellite communications, missile warning, and other effects such as electronic warfare. Those are the things that are done. That relationship is critical. There has to be that division so that one can concentrate on warfighting and one can uh, concentrate on organized training and equip, and part of that is bringing uh, better capabilities, more sophisticated capabilities to the space domain uh, here now and in the future. So what are your operational priorities? So since I've been the commander of uh, U.S. Space Command for the last three plus years, uh, my intent was to try to be consistent with what my priorities are. My first priority is making sure that we are able to understand the space domain. And what I mean by that is how are we able to look into the space domain and characterize whatever actions may be happening or events that are happening in the space domain. And that's a large task. 
Because if you can't see it and understand it and characterize it, there's certainly nothing you can really do about it. You have to be able to have that situational awareness just like you do in the other domains, whether it's air, land, or sea, and for that matter, cyber. So uh, we've spent a lot of work, uh, a lot of time and effort over the last uh, three plus years of doing that very function. And it, it breaks down into three, three categories. One is uh, we have looked across uh, both missile defense and space and said, what sensors are out there today that could do space domain awareness for me that we haven't leveraged in the past? And so we kind of settled on some of these missile defense sensors, TPY2s, Aegis BMT ships, um, other sensors that are, that are uh, uh, part of the air and missile defense portfolio. And how do we bring them into our architecture so that they can do space domain awareness for me? Because in space, it's all, we talked about the FOB, it's all about having custody. And so if I can maintain custody of an object, uh, whether it's exquisite or not exquisite, that's the key. Because if it's not exquisite, then I can maintain custody and hand it off to an exquisite capability. But maintaining custody frees up a lot of time for me in terms of always having to look up and decide if that's the thing I was really looking at or whether or not it's something that's in custody and passed off to an exquisite capability. That's one. So we've been doing a lot of that for... Uh, the last three years. And I would tell you, we, we weren't, we, there, it's not fully integrated yet. I would term it more of an interoperable. And so, you know, in my mind, full integration is machine to machine. But uh, what has been good about that is, is going out and finding what's good enough today and then uh, advance it, improve it to be exquisite tomorrow. The other piece to that is we work very closely with our allies and partners in that very endeavor of space domain awareness. Uh, around the world. And uh, we have a commercial integration cell, commercial integration strategy for U.S. Space Command, but in particular we have a joint commercial operations cell in Colorado Springs that takes space domain awareness commercial sensors and capabilities, telescopes and sensors, that bring all of that together so that we can look into the space domain from an unclassified capability. That has worked very well from a commercial integration piece, but it also has allowed us to work with our allies and partners in a big way in terms of their participation in that, their ability to, to use that data as well and share that data. And the advantage of the unclassified piece to that is that that allows me, if it's unclassified, that we can strategically message that very quickly, depending on the event that, that happens in space. I described all of you the SJ-21 a couple years ago when that happened. That was actually... Uh, observed using our commercial integration, our JCO in Colorado Springs. And so that allowed me to, allowed the command and our allies and partners to, to observe that event and uh, do the messaging we felt that was appropriate at that time. Um, we've improved that, as you can imagine. You always try to improve things. We've been improving that over the years. Uh, we've actually stood up two more um, integration cells uh, around the world. One is in uh, the UK and one is in uh, New Zealand. And uh, the theory or the concept behind that is those operations centers follow the sun. So it starts in Colorado Springs, it'll go to the United Kingdom and then it'll end up in New Zealand and it'll hand it back over to us when it comes around, you know, that time of the day again. And why is that important is because that allows us to integrate with our allies and partners. And as we watch our allies and partners get more capable, we're watching their space commercial industry within their respective countries uh, starting to participate in that as well. And so, uh, you know, in my mind, you can't have enough space domain aware awareness sensors or capabilities because the space is big and you've got to be able to look at it. And when you're talking about domain awareness, it really does matter on location, location, location. So we can have those capabilities uh, geographically dispersed around the world makes us more are, makes us better and more capable, and it goes back to my maintaining custody of objects in space. So, uh, what if I could ask you about uh, JP three one four? Big big changes there in terms of space operations. It's more explicit about offense defense. Uh, retires some terms like counter space. Uh, so, I wonder if you could talk to us about some of the most important changes there, uh, why they matter, and how it, how it matters to you. Sure. So JP314, uh, in my mind, uh, a big achievement for the, the Department of Defense, Joint Staff, and, and the Greater uh, Combatant Commands and Services. Uh, I think it's, uh, 
it updated from about three years ago. I think the last one was in 2020. So uh, this is the first time that U.S. Space Command was the primary lead for the update to the JP-314. Uh, I think it did a lot of good things in terms of defining what our AOR is. So U.S. Space Command is, uh, some people confuse and say that U.S. Space Command is a functional combatant command. Uh, we're both a functional as well as a astrographic combatant command. And so different than like UCOM, Indo-PACOM, where we have longitude, latitude, or lines on the map or around the globe, you know, our line starts at, and it's defined in JP314, at 100 kilometers out to the edge of the universe. So we might be the biggest AOR. I'm pretty sure we are. Uh, heard... <laughs> so, uh, uh, but, I, you know, my counter to that is, you know, we may be the biggest uh, AOR in terms of space, physical space, but we have the fewest number of humans that live in it. And uh, I think that's going to grow over the years. I know it will as we, as we go to the moon and beyond and as the commercial market starts putting more humans into space. But as we sit here today, I, I won't ask the audience. I usually try to do that. How many humans do you think are living in space right now? And I'll just give you the short answer. There's 10. So there's seven on the International Space Station, and there's three takeonauts on the Chinese Space Station that I mentioned just a little bit ago. So the, that, the JP314 answers that question, defines that. It, it also normalizes some of the uh, language and in, in terms. In other words, as we look to the space domain, you know, the space domain is not a special domain. It is a very unique domain, and I think we can all agree it's unique, but it's not special. And in that vein, we've tried to do, um, we try to develop terms that are consistent with the other domains and the other doctrine within the services as well as the uh, as the COCOMs or on the joint staff. And so, you know, terms such as uh, key terrain and those kinds of things are terms that we're using. You know, so for our key terrain in the space domain, what would that be? Well, of course, it would be a celestial body of some sort. could be a Lagrange point. It could be one of those. But that uh, publication is not developed just for General Dickinson and the space enterprise. That, that doctrine is developed so that folks in other domains that are doing operational planning and operations have a doctrine to go to to understand how they incorporate that into their operational planning. Because one of the things we've worked on very hard over the last three years in terms of advocacy for space, understanding of space, is that you got to include space in your planning efforts at the very beginning of your planning process, not at the end. And so it can't be an afterthought at the end to go, okay, now we've got to have space. We want to have it up front, and it's integrated and part of the entire plan from start to finish. So uh, in February, CSO Saltzman came over here to CSAS and kind of unveiled their uh, theory of success uh, comp uh, comment that talked about uh, campaigning through competition. Obviously, this is a big theme of the, of the NDS. And so I wonder how you're thinking about deterrence campaigns in space. And one thing that comes to mind there is, of course, the, the adage that you reveal to deter and you conceal to win. And there seems to be a push to doing a little bit more revealing uh, in the interest of deterrence. So thoughts on that campaigning uh, in space? Well, you know, I would just right up front say that, you know, we, we compete every day in space now. You know, I mean, it's like, uh, and, you know, we st stood up in 2019. We were competing the day that we stood up. And so uh, in terms of what we do each and every day, you're correct. You know, that's, that's my philosophy on the reveal and conceal. That's what you mentioned. So, you know, you reveal to deter and you conceal to win someday or on that day. And so we, we do that each and every day in terms of what we do with, uh, in particular, with our allies and partners in creating the deterrence that uh, the PRC and the Russians, you know, are observing. And so a lot of that I can't get into too much detail here. But, uh, you know, really when you look at what our theories of success is or how we see ourselves uh, within the combatant command, you know, we see ourselves really working. You know, we have this thing called the convergence of triads. And, uh, and that's where we have looked at each of the mission areas, each of the operations that we do, and we look at how we're going to leverage uh, each of those components. I'll give you an example. So uh, when we look at uh, deterrence, we look at it for, through the lens of the three pieces to a space system. Uh, the satellite on orbit, that's very obvious, the link from the satellite to the ground, and then the ground station and command and control to whoever makes those decisions or sends those commands. And so if you look at that kind of a triad, if you will, 
That's how we approach our operations within the command. And that's both from, an, uh, from a uh, red perspective as well as a blue perspective. So if we think we're vulnerable with those three legs or three segments of the space system, uh, and we protect and defend on those, th those are the vulnerabilities that we look to uh, look to in towards of the PRC and the Russians. That's how we kind of look. That's one of the triads. The other one is our allied and partner and commercial integration and how we do that. Our newest one is the missile warning, missile defense in space. And I can talk about that here in a minute with our new UCP task. And so, the, and the final one, because there's four of them, I think I'm at three. Uh, the fourth one is how do we work with cyber, soft, special operations forces, and space? Uh, and that actually kind of goes back to the triad that I talked about that talks about the, uh, the three segments of the space system. So when you're talking about deterrence type of operations, that's the lens through which we look in U.S. Space Command. So we've had basically the same question come in from two people, and since I know them both, I'll credit them both. Uh, both Teresa Hitchens uh, from Breaking Defense uh, and Jason Suslovich from Blue Origin both want to know about uh, space mobility and logistics and its relation to dynamic space operations uh, and uh, perhaps any requirements that Space Command is, uh, is helping set on space mobility and logistics in particular. Sure, so, so when I talked about JP314, you know, I talked about, hey, how do we get a uh, common lexicon language like we do in other domains? And so with what I'm gonna talk about is dynamic space operations. And the need for us in, today and in the future is how do we have a capability to do sustained maneuver in space? How do we build capabilities, use technology, uh, to be able to have sustained maneuver. And what I mean by that is satellites that are on orbit right now have a finite amount of consumable uh, resources on them. I'm talking about fuel, I'm talking about battery life, and then I'm talking about uh, you know, act actually braking and having to be repaired. And we have to have the capability like we do in the other domains to be able to refuel, fix, and uh, if we need to on orbit. Because right now we can't be constrained by consumables, we aren't in other domains. If you think about the Air Force, they have air refueling capabilities. You think about ground operations, we have uh, you know, refueling capabilities that move with our maneuver force so that when we're, we're conducting an operation, we top off and then when we're done, we refill. We have to be able to do that in the space domain. That is because the amount of activity uh, in the operations that you just described earlier in your question, those are right now performed by satellites that have a uh, finite amount of fuel. And so, in that case. So we've got to go to that. We also have to go to another concept which is tactically responsive launch. So, replenishment, augmentation, reconstitution in the space domain has got to be something we were able to do very quickly and very soon. Because as we watch, I just went through uh, the PRC you know, threat and what they're doing today and tomorrow is we've got to be able to do that kind of opportunity. We do it in other domains, right? You'll hear me over and over go, tying it back to another domain. So if we have a, a mega constellation, or if we have a constellation you know, of any type of capability, satellite communications, GPS, or whatever, we ought to be rap able to rapidly reconstitute that if we need to. And so we're watching the commercial industry today and how they are able to do you know, uh, launches and build out of mega constellations. Don't need to tell anybody in this audience, you know, the company that's doing that right now, I think they had their 80th launch uh, for the year. Uh, that is a pretty rapid launch cadence. And the, and the uh, use of those boosters, uh, you know, in terms of numbers of time they're able to be used and capabilities that they can put on orbit or could put on orbit is what we're very interested in. So our ability to do that is fundamental. So it's dynamic space operations as well as tactically responsive launch. Well, let me bring us down to, again to some, some ground forces uh, uh, for, the, for this dialogue. Uh, we're seeing a lot of activity uh, in Israel right now, including Iron Dome, but lots of other things as well. Uh, to the extent you're able, could you talk about how Space Command is uh, providing support to our friends in Israel, uh, but also perhaps to CENTCOM uh, more broadly? Yeah, well, so um, first of all, I'll say that our support uh, to, you know, to the CENTCOM AOR in this case is consistent with what we do for all the other AORs. So in other words, space is global. My 
mission of providing space enabling capabilities doesn't necessarily focus on one uh, geographic, uh, vice astrographic, geographic AOR. And in this case, you know, uh, we, we routinely uh, provide missile warning, position navigation and timing services, as well as satellite communications. And so if I were to talk about the JCO cell that I just did a minute ago, we also provide that information uh, to, that, to the CENTCOM AOR, which is fundamental to what they do. And so um, we, we have allies and partners from all, you know, many, many nations that contribute to that. But uh, we're doing that kind of thing. I'll give you an example. Um, in Ukraine right now, uh, war's been going on, what, a year and a half now or so. Uh, I, we, we provide missile warning indications, uh, you know, using our satellite uh, capabilities. I think we're up over 16,000 uh, warnings that we have provided to the UCOM AOR and to General Kaboli and his forces there. But we routinely do that. We do that anywhere around. We do it in Indo-Pacific. So we do that all the time because of the globalness of our mission set. So, you know, satellites that we have in geo-orbit, you know, people think of that as well, what geographic region. Well, in many cases, they serve as many several geographic regions just because of the where they are in the geo belt and what they can see on the earth. So um, I go back to, we routinely provide that. The COCOM will ask us through a request process if they want enhancements to those capabilities and we respond to that as well. 16,000, that's a lot of warnings uh, in, the, in the past two years. Uh, so let me return to the, to the missile defense issue. You're again, the senior air defender in the Pentagon. You've, done, you've had all these different commands. Big picture, I think especially reflecting on the lessons in the past three years or so in, in your current role, uh, talk about your, your understanding and your vision for the relationship between space and missile defense. Yeah, so we, we worked on that for a couple of years within the command, within the department of, you know, where does, you know, do, where does missile defense belong in terms of the COCOM? For years it had been performed by U.S. Strategic Command. Uh, and, and, and as we, and if you recall, so, you know, if you go back and you look at the history of U.S. Space Command, you know, we existed from 1985 to 2002. In 2002, after 9-11, a decision was made that to stand down the old U.S. Space Command and uh, transfer those space mission areas over to Offutt Air Force Base and U.S. Strategic Command. And uh, in that, in part of that, they had the missile defense piece. Um, but when U.S. Space Command stood back up and I took command, and then I had a former command in U.S. Army Space and Missile Defense Command, it was obvious to me that there, there are a lot of synergies between the missile defense enterprise as well as the space enterprise. And so as I mentioned earlier, you know, we've been leveraging missile defense radars that weren't necessarily built for space domain awareness but have capability, and then take that capability, put a requirement on the department to make it into an exquisite space domain awareness capability. So from a technical piece, there is synergies between the two two uh, enterprises, and vice versa. There's things that we're doing in space that can enhance missile defense. And so how do you get that synergy, unity of effort, unity of command, if you will, um, in the department? You do that, our recommendation was, you do that by moving that, that missile defense enterprise or responsibilities into U.S. Space Command. So in April, Unified Command Plan came out, and uh, that trans-regional missile defense planning and operations support mission area came to U.S. Space Command. And with that came uh, JFCC IMD, Joint Force Component Command for Integrated Missile Defense, led by Lieutenant General Dan Karbler. And when that organization moved with it, that was an instant infusion of missile defense expertise within U.S. Space Command. And so, uh, of course, the staff, my staff, had a, okay, so how do we absorb that missile defense uh, role? Uh, and I think we've made great progress over uh, the last uh, couple, few months since we got the Unified Command Plan. Of course, we were planning for that before the transfer because we, we were banking on the fact that that was happening, going to happen. So there's a lot of synergies between that. And when you look at it, we're looking at uh, what the MDR, the 2022 MDR came out with, which was that we need to start looking very closely at not just missile defense, but how do you get to missile defeat? And so uh, missile defeat is much, is, is much broader than missile defense, and I'll, I'll characterize it as saying that traditionally we kind of look at missile defense from mid-course to terminal in the terms of the phase of flight of a ballistic missile, for example. So you can think of apogee until the time it hits its target. That's the boost phase, 
mid-course phase and the terminal phase. The department, we as a community, space and missile defense community, need to start looking towards the other part of that flight path, which is the, the uh, before the launch, as well as the boost phase, in terms of what capabilities can we bring to bear or uh, have developed that will help us with that uh, cost curve problem. And so the cost curve problem is where we're spending so much money on interceptors in the last part of the mid-course to terminal flight, as opposed to maybe spending a little bit more money in the area I'm describing, which could give us capabilities to defeat that missile before it either takes off or very early on in its flight. And when you look at it from a capabilities perspective, it is the most dangerous in mid-course to terminal. It's the most vulnerable on the first part of that, uh, on the first part of that event. So uh, the JP314 talks about missile warning uh, as a key spacecom mission area, but that's distinct, as you've mentioned uh, just now, from missile tracking uh, and specifically fire control quality tracks to support uh, all the missile defense and stuff for you. What does fire control quality track mean to you, and why is it important? Uh, exceptionally important. Uh, fire quality track data is that is going to determine the success or failure of whatever weapon system you're employing to defeat that threat. And so, you know, missile warning in my mind is a little bit less in terms of the quality of the data because a lot of the missile warning is to alert so people can protect, be protected. The missile tracking piece to that is more fidelity by more sensors maybe looking at that same threat and providing more and more fidelity target quality data that you can actually use to action and inform a weapon system from the time it launches until the time it defeats whatever the threat may be. There's a whole lot of attention and kind of enthusiasm for PLEO, for proliferated LEO, uh, for the tracking uh, mission in particular, uh, and SDA and Space Force are moving out uh, on that front. Uh, a lot of attention is to the numbers, to the proliferation part, uh, but it's the using of that data uh, I'm talking about here the sensor fusion challenge between all this disparate data from different places and different phenomenologies. Uh, the sensor fusion and also do we have the ground uh, systems, the ground nodes to be able to process that in, a, in an effective way. How do you think about those problems? Well, well, first on the proliferated LEO constellations, we have learned that watching the uh, conflict in Russia and Ukraine in terms of what a proliferated constellation means. Uh, and it means a lot. So, you know, in, in the space business, you're looking for redundancy and resiliency. Uh, and when you have thousands of satellites that are performing that mission, it makes it very complex for your adversary or your competitor to know how many they have to take out and which ones they have to take out. So from like a resiliency, redundancy perspective, uh, it, it is where the department is going, and I fully support that. The efforts of uh, Derek Trenier and the Space Development Agency were going in the right direction. In terms of uh, your, your comment about ground stations is that, uh, as I mentioned in my triad, you know, the satellite, the link, and the ground station, you know, we have to remember that you have to have a ground station that's capable of leveraging the exquisite on-orbit assets that we have today. So in other words, uh, whether it's a service, but in this case it, it's the services, when you put a capability on orbit and it's fully operational to provide you a better capability, You've got to have the ground stations that can leverage that uh, for many reasons. So the synchronization and the coordination of the procurement of that, given, given what's uh, on orbit, is very critical. And so what you don't want to have is where you have outdated ground stations that can't leverage the new capabilities on orbit. Uh, because now you're, you're not leveraging, you know, obviously, a better capability in where the department has put some money. So it's important that we remember that, and that requires close synchronization between uh, Space Force, Space Command, and the services in terms of communicating what we're putting on orbit and when it will be available so that they have the opportunity to make sure that they not only have the ground segment uh, that they'll need, but they've been trained on it and how to use it. But going back to the fundamentally the goals of resilience and the goals of uh, mission assurance, uh, how do you think about the risk of putting all our eggs in the PLEO basket? Uh, what is the, you know, there's certain, certain things that are perhaps able to uh, threaten PLEO, be it cyber, uh, be it uh, debris, be it perhaps radiation of different kinds. Uh, so how do you think about the utility of, of diversifying among orbits and inclinations as well? 
Well, so I, I kind of look at, I look at it, uh, space as I look at missile defense, and that is you have to have a layered approach to both. So uh, your eggs in one basket analogy is, yes, I mean, you know, we don't want to become so dependent or so vulnerable pot potentially in the PLEO that uh, we're not able to have that information or have that function provided to us, as opposed to, you know, having a diversified diversification where you have uh, capabilities in different orbital regimes that you can rely on, so you're not all on one. But you got to remember, too, that in the, that PLEO piece is there'll always be a terrestrial piece as well. So in terms of layeredness or layers, you will have an on-orbit capability, whether that's in PLEO, as you described, could still have some in GEO that we rely on, and we'll have some that is in the uh, terrestrial domain that we rely on today in terms of UEWRs as well as missile defense types of radars on ships or on the ground. So, Sandra Irwin, if I could bring this back to kind of more Army-specific things for a minute. Uh, Sandra Irwin from Space uh, News asks, uh, we often hear there's not enough space resources to meet the ground forces' needs. Uh, the Space Force's budget may not grow that much, so who's going to pay for this? Uh, will Space Command advocate for more funding to fund those space programs? Well, I mean, that, that, that's, that's a role I have as a COCOM commander. You know, I always say that, you know, COCOM commanders are greedy and impatient. And so uh, I'm looking for more capability sooner. Uh, but what we do as the combatant command is we, uh, at, we develop requirements, uh, requirements that we need to do the mission, uh, both from a terrestrial perspective or space enabling perspective, as well as what we have to do on orbit with our protect and defend mission. So uh, the command is uh, maturing, and in fact, is very mature in our J-8 right now in terms of producing integrated priority lists. Uh, producing initial capabilities documents, issue papers, uh, uh, those levers that I have that put a demand signal on the department um, to be able to get those requirements fulfilled and capabilities delivered. So we do that, and now we're doing that for missile defense as well. Part of that transfer, if you will, of missile defense to U.S. Space Command, we also got the warfighter uh, in the loop or the whip process that came with that uh, and missile defense governance process. And we're also now, uh, you know, one of the, one of the uh, principles within the missile defense executive board governance process. And so that's another way that we're putting the missile defense requirements under the department. Well, speaking of that, um, you know, your space band being stand up uh, meant that some uh, resources, some personnel were going to flow, obviously, from Army Space and Missile Defense Command, your previous, uh, your previous command. How would you talk about the relationship between SMDC and, and Space Command and uh, how the Army is uh, benefiting and growing in, that, in the, new, uh, the new order? Yeah, so, uh, so from the very beginning, back in 2019, uh, U.S. Army Space and Missile Defense Command was designated as the Army service component to U.S. Space Command and to U.S. STRATCOM, and now a little bit with U.S. Northern Command. Uh, so, uh, General Har Carbler wears many hats to include the uh, commander of JFCCIMD. So, from that perspective, we've had great integration from the very beginning with, uh, with uh, General Carbler or SMDC. Um, but I will tell you, you know, we've seen over the last couple of years kind of the transfer of some of the Army space capabilities or space missionaries that they used to do, satellite communications, and most recently the JTAGs, uh, missile warning capability, moved from the Army to uh, the Space Force as well as uh, SATCOM, which is the WGS uh, provider from, uh, SM, from the Army to uh, Space Force. People ask me if I thought, think that's a, that was a good idea. I think it's a great idea. Uh, being able to realize the synergies of having both missile warning, that missile warning capability that provides missile warning in theater, as well as the satellite communications, having that in the Space Force where they do similar things with other capabilities with missile warning and satellite communication, I think just breeds efficiency and optimization, if you will, and ultimately support to the uh, combatant commands. Um, I think the Army has actually done a lot in space in terms of uh, new, new formations, new capabilities. Uh, they absolutely realize how important space is to what they do, you know, now until 2040 uh, in land power. But they've taken a lot of action, too. So. They've got MDTFs now. I think they've got three multi-domain task forces that do what? Integrate those types of capability, in particular space, 
and how important that is. And of course, they've always had their FA-40 cadre within the Army that, that understands space, and many of them work uh, within U.S. Space Command. So I think from the perspective of their contributions and how they're integrated into U.S. Space Command, it's, it's very, very good. So staying with the, the Army, but a different part, uh, I'm thinking the, the National Guard here, not a future Space Guard, but the National Guard. Uh, already today provides significant space capability. Half of our offensive space EW uh, that you, you've mentioned uh, before, it provides uh, survival missile warning and operates uh, three ground-based missile warning, how, as well as GMD uh, up, uh, up in Alaska. So how do you think about the Guard's role uh, supporting your command going forward? So I've always thought it is a big piece to what we do. It is a big combat multiplier for the command, uh, not only in space, but missile defense. And so when we stood up the command to, uh, back in 2019, we had a, over, just in the headquarters, we had a, over 100 uh, National Guardsmen and reservists uh, from all the services show up to the door because we had a sign on the door that says, we're open. They said, we're here to help. And they came in and they really pushed us in the direction of establishing, uh, getting set up from the very beginning. I think it was over 100 or so, maybe even 120 at the very beginning of 2019. Of course, today that number is uh, a little bit smaller, but they provide an incredible perspective to what we do each and every day. That's in the headquarters. Of course, uh, Tom, as you mentioned, we've got National Guardsmen that are doing work within the space enterprise itself, from missile warning to electronic warfare, uh, and, and that is critical to, to allow us to have that capability when we need to surge, or in some cases doing day-to-day -day operations. Uh, their perspective is very interesting because uh, many of them are working in the space industry, commercial space industry, uh, you know, during their daytime jobs. And then when they come either on active duty or they do their drill time, they bring that commercial space expertise into the command and it's an immediate infusion because Many of them are working on cutting edge technologies. And you know, for me, that's where we get some of the good ideas of what is in the realm of possible in the commercial industry. And so uh, as I talked about dynamic space operations, tactically responsive launch, our commercial uh, industry is looking very closely at that now. And we have to leverage that capability. If I go to the missile defense side, you know, from my old unit, US Army Space and Missile Defense Command with the 100th GMD Brigade, you know, we watch National Guardsmen each and every day protecting this great nation. You know, there's 300 of them protecting over 300 million Americans each and every day. You don't hear a lot about them. But uh, they're standing watch in Colorado Springs and up in Fort Greeley, Alaska, each and every day. And I uh, just want to make sure we don't forget that and the other 18,000 service members in U.S. Space Command around the world doing the space mission and now the missile defense mission for their country. The one last thing on the reserve component I would just highlight, uh, for example, in in uh, SMDC, there's the 1st Space Brigade, and uh, that brigade out in Colorado Springs actually has resident within that formation all three components. Has an act active duty battalion, has a reserve component battalion, has a National Guard battalion. So when you're talking about hey, how, do, how does everybody integrate, complement one another, train, and deploy, that's how they do that. And they've been doing that for years. And so reserve component is critical to the command. And, uh, you know, we, we looked at every opportunity to leverage that in terms of can they provide additional manning personnel expertise uh, or how we can augment our teams right now. Well, since you mentioned the commercial uh, aspect of things, I'll st stay with that. OSD and Space Force are working on uh, commercial space strategies. I'm curious what you're looking for uh, as that goes forward and also how you're partnering with industry uh, and uh, perhaps what you're... Uh, perhaps hopeful for, for whether it be space startups or the bigs? Yeah, so we partner with uh, about a, a little over 130 commercial companies today. That has been a priority within the command, is how do we leverage the commercial market industry to complement uh, what we're doing today in U.S. Space Command? In, in other words, what is out there that's good enough today that we can leverage in the commercial market? Much of that has to do with what I described in our SDA uh, efforts in Colorado Springs and, as I mentioned, in the United Kingdom as well as New Zealand. The other area we look very closely at is how do we partner with satellite communications. That resides out at Vandenberg Space Force Base. There's 10 partners out there right now, and there's, there's many more that want to be part of that uh, commercial effort out there providing satellite communications. So we developed a, uh, uh, because we had such a, 
bow wave, if you will, of commercial companies that wanted to come work and partner with the U.S. Space Command. We had, a, we had a stop for a period of time, restructure our strategy so that we could properly bring them into what we were trying to do in U.S. Space Command. So that's been out since, I think, April of 2022. And uh, really, that is more of a, that is a framework for cooperation. So I want to be clear, that's a framework for cooperation. The acquisition side to that, which uh, you're describing, is going to be part of the Space Force commercial integration strategy, as well as OSD policy, Dr. Plum's um, uh, commercial integration strategy. And that will be more on, the, obviously, the policy side for Dr. Plum and for General Saltzman. It will be on the mechanics, if you will, the acquisition of those services. Now, from a U.S. Space Command's perspective, you know, how do I see commercial integration coming into the command? I think, you know, we have to leverage the, the great commercial in the U.S. space industry for sure. Uh, if you look right now, I think there's about 10,000 companies around the world that do space. Uh, 6,000 of those are U.S. companies. And so there is a lot of opportunity, a lot of potential in the commercial market. And I will tell you that uh, as we've seen, you know, with the Ukraine-Russia conflict, you know, the department's looking very carefully at how those, uh, how those um, contracts, how those relationships are built to make sure what? That we have them in time of conflict or when we need them the most. And so as we look to that, the, you know, I know the uh, Space Force is looking very carefully how we develop that so we have that relationship. And we've seen that in other domains. Again, I go back to we've seen that in the, uh, in the air domain with the craft. Uh, framework that they use. Not identical, but kind of a starting point for how we're looking at uh, what I believe they call the CASR that's in being developed in the Space Force that does that similar type of activity or uh, commitments, if you will, from the commercial industry. Do I see commercial uh, being, you know, are we going to go totally commercial within the U.S. Space Command and the DOD Space Enterprise? I think the answer is, I go back to my, it's got to be a balanced and layered approach. I think some some mission areas that I have, we can leverage uh, a lot more of the commercial industry and I'll maybe a little bit less on the military side, but there'll be some military mission areas I think that we will always want to have exquisite military capabilities that are always there when we need them and are layered in their defense and capabilities. So allies and partners, you said no nation can go, go it alone in space. What if you could talk about some of the activities, Olympic defenders, CSPO, on the missile defense side, Nimble Titan, the activities that you're doing and maybe some of the challenges on that front. Yeah, so, uh, well, look, I'll start with space. So uh, we, we, do, we do a lot of exercises and activities uh, with our allies and partners. One in particular is an exercise program we call Global Sentinel. And so Global Sentinel, uh, last time we did it, last summer, I think we had about 25 nations. We'll do it again next year. We'll probably have close to 30 nations that show up. And uh, it's an unclassified event. And it focuses a lot on, well, focuses on space operations, where we actually stand up space operations cells for the allies and partners in an unclassified environment, which allows us to do a lot more information sharing, obviously, and a lot more relationship building. And so we'll do that again uh, next year. But what we do in that is we have four or five different vignettes that we work through that really pushes them and us to think about policy, makes us think about operations, thinks about capabilities that we either have today or we need tomorrow. The second one is now with the missile defense transfer into U.S. SpaceCon. We, uh, we inherited this great Nimble Titan uh, exercise program that's been around for many, many years, uh, grown in, uh, grown in uh, participants uh, as we have seen in Global Sentinel, uh, but in a missile defense uh, arena. Uh, that too is an unclassified event uh, that uh, exercises missile defense policy and operations. And uh, I just spoke about a year ago in Amsterdam to the whole group and I, I challenged them at that time. I said, uh, this is a great missile defense experiment exercise. I challenged them to include space in it. So the, the evolution we're doing now with Nimble Titan has space in it as part of the missile defense play. So the, the uh, objective is how do we get you know, policy makers from space Policy, uh, policy folks for missile defense from each of these countries and start talking to one another and understanding what I was describing as the synergies between space and missile defense. Well, I think if, if it might just sort of transition to your uh, vision for the future, maybe some reflections on, on the past couple of years. You mentioned in, in the context of the New Dole, for instance, the 2021 uh, ASAT, you know, you, you, you call it irresponsible 
you know, which presupposes norms. It presupposes, you know, a certain expectation. Uh, we were talking earlier about uh, the comparison between space and the high seas, right? And it took us a couple hundred years to figure out kind of what are the rules of that uh, on the high seas. So as you think about your, your responsibility to protect U.S. assets and perhaps commercial assets, how is that uh, analogy to the high seas perhaps useful, instructive, and, and again, thinking in the, in the future-oriented sense? Yeah, I think, you know, when you look at the... Uh, you know, the high seas in your, your question is, uh, you know, I think there's an expectation that uh, there's, a, there's a reasonable amount of security in that specific domain, the maritime domain, for example. Uh, you can't be everywhere all the time to defend everything, but you have to have the capability to defend when you need to against assets that you consider very important. And so when you look at the space domain, you know, we, we really have to, as a, as a global community, come to a realization of what are the norms of behavior, what are the guiding principles for responsible behavior in space. Uh, you know, I'll just talk about the, you know, the commercial market in terms of putting more, you know, putting mega constellations on orbit. You know, how do we, how do we govern that in terms of making sure that, you know, uh, satellites are properly disposed of when, when, the time, when their end of life comes? Or that uh, they understand, like, you know, how close you can come to a satellite and, and be considered still at a safe distance. Those kinds of fundamental things, I think, are important. Now, um, in terms of the Department of Defense, I mentioned earlier that, you know, I, I've got the tenets of responsible behavior from my boss, Secretary Austin, but that really only applies to Department of Defense. This is a broader uh, whole of government for the United States, and really whole of the world, if you will, in terms of how do we get to an understanding of what that is. And there's a lot of efforts going on. I mean, they've got the open-ended uh, open working group in the UN that has met several times that is talking about this. And you've got many nations that, are, that, are, that understand that. Well, a lot of nations do, uh, the importance of having those uh, characteristics or those norms established. But, I, you know, I'll just end it by saying uh, we don't have, you know, 70 or a couple of hundred years to kind of figure that out. Like you mentioned in your, uh, your maritime high seas analogy, I mean, that it is here and now, and uh, my hope is that we get to that understanding as quickly as we can. So I wonder if you could reflect a bit on your career. Um, you know, someone looks at your bio, many air, air and missile defense uh, commands and, and posts. Uh, you've got a master's in ORSA. I'm, I'm wondering how your, your ORSA operations research and systems analysis perhaps uh, shapes your, your thoughts on the future. Just broadly speaking, how would you say things have changed over the course of your career? And what are some reflections that you think about you wish you might have known at SMDC or in some of these other commands over the years? Yeah, so that's a great question. And uh, scratch my head a little bit because uh, it, it has been a long, yeah, it's been a great career. I mean, 30, 37 plus years. But as I, you know, there's some things that have remained the same and some things that are changed. And I would just say uh, one thing that's stayed the same is really um, in my mind because, you know, along that journey, I was a Patriot Battery Commander. So made the transition from a Hawk Air Defense System, which is in the museum now, uh, to Patriot, and, uh, and, and deployed. I deployed as a Battery Commander, as a Patriot Battery Commander. I deployed my Patriot Battalion for OIF. And uh, I think what has stayed the same is how strategic Patriot is to this nation and the world. So a tactical weapon system still has very, very important strategic implications and uh, importance. And we're seeing that today again. And, uh, and it's not only the patriot of the United States, the, the absolute investments of our allies and partners in that very system. And so that's kind of stayed the same, if you will, since I was a battery commander till today. I think what's changed is really, uh, in a, on a good note, is really the, the understanding of that as a strategic asset how important that is, and how important it is to our allies and partners in the joint force, and the, the ability to not only take that, but start looking at the layered capabilities that are required in order to make it more effective. And so uh, I'm really proud you know, of, of where the Army has gone with uh, air and missile defense. They continue. There's a lot of great work going on in the Army right now in terms of improvement of the Patriot system, improvement of our ability to have a better C2 system capability That'll provide the best shooter with the best sensor, best effector, joint kill web, you know, those kinds of uh, concepts. And I think that's going to make us more uh, 
be able to do our jobs even better. Um, but as I reflect back on, uh, on that, I would just say that uh, it's amazing to me, though, not only missile defense, but the understanding and advocacy for space. And so I, I frequently sit in forums now, uh, four years ago, uh, I would be the one that had to raise my hand and say, hey, space is really important. You know, hey, everybody, space is really important. You know, just as recently as today, I sat in a forum where, uh, where I wasn't, I, I didn't have to say very much about space. It was all the other folks that were in that room recognizing the significance and importance of space for military purposes, operations, but also for our way of life. And so over the course of just four years, I think the department's made a lot of progress in, uh, well, one, stand up of a space force and a combat command, but more so is the understanding and the integration of space into what we do today and tomorrow. Well, thank you, sir. I really appreciate your coming out. Uh, thanks to our partners uh, at AUSA. Uh, we've, we've enjoyed having you uh, here over the years, and we uh, always welcome you back. Uh, thanks to our thank sponsors. You, thanks for everybody who came out. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.